Have you checked out the Somebody You Love Patreon yet? For just $3 a month, you can get every episode without ads and you get them a day early. For $6 a month, you get all of our bloopers and behind-the-scenes action. For $10 a month, you get monthly bonus episodes. And for $20 a month, you also get the bonus episodes as videos. You can cancel anytime, and when you sign up, you get access to everything that we've posted so far. We also have annual subscriptions where you save 10% and get one month free. Patreon.com slash somebodyyoupod, as in podcast. You do have to type in the URL because Patreon hides 18 plus creators from the search, so you most likely won't be able to find us by searching. That's patreon.com slash somebodyyoupod. Welcome to Somebody You Love, or the sale of two titties. I'm Jenna Love. And I'm Holly Hart. And we're experts in disappointing our parents, breaching community guidelines, and banging the people who vote against our rights. Hey everyone, the first thing we'd like to do is acknowledge the traditional custodians of the unceded land from which we are recording, and on which many of you are listening across so-called Australia. Holly is on the land of the Ngunnawal people. I'm on Darug and Gundungurra land. Jules is on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And Dylan is calling in from Nam on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, which is very relevant to our topic. Today on the show, we have a very special episode focusing on the most recent developments in the sex work decrim space. On Thursday, the 10th of February, the Sex Work Decriminalisation Bill 2021 was passed in Victorian Parliament. And while we've all been celebrating the extraordinary work of everyone who contributed to this historic milestone, it has been somewhat bittersweet. So this is a huge achievement for the sex worker rights movement. The state of Victoria will be the fourth place in the world and the third place in Australia to have what they call decrim. Although, as I suspect we're going to talk plenty about in this episode, it is not quite as straightforward as that and it's probably not really an accurate way of putting it in reality. We are so grateful to be joined by two people who are incredibly busy right now and who have been absolutely central to this process. Dylan O'Hara, the acting manager of Vixen, Victoria's peer-only sex work organisation, and Jules Kim, the CEO of Scarlet Alliance, Australian Sex Workers Association. Dylan is a sex worker and advocate who has been tirelessly volunteering their time with Vixen Collective for many years. They have been the advocacy coordinator for the past two years and recently appointed acting manager of Vixen. They have been involved in advocacy in Aotearoa, Australia and online for over a decade, were the editor and contributor of US-based sex worker group blog Tits and Sass, and their passions are sex worker rights organising, workers' rights and trans liberation. They don't have any hobbies because they don't have any free time. Jules is a Korean-Australian sex worker and advocate who migrated to Australia at a young age. She first got her start in the industry as a way to afford better gear and studio time for her band. Since then, she has worked in various areas of the sex industry, both in Australia and overseas. Jules' advocacy bio is an exhausting read. To name a few pieces, she managed the Scarlet Alliance Migration Project for a number of years, she was the chair of the Asia-Pacific Network of Sex Workers, and was the UN Program Coordinating Board NGO Delegate for the Asia-Pacific. I wish I could wrap this paragraph up with a, and in her spare time she enjoys as well, but based on the text messages that I sometimes get from her at 1am, I don't think she knows the meaning of the concept. Welcome to the show, Dylan and Jules, and thank you so much for joining us. Hello. Hi. 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 Hi (laughs) We know that you both have incredibly busy schedules at the moment and probably not a whole lot of sleep. So we're really appreciative that you've taken some time out to come and chat to us. So uh, for our listeners, in episode 10 of our show, we did a big discussion on the decriminalization of sex work and how important it is. So that's probably a good one to check out. If you're interested in this stuff, you may want to go back and listen to that to get a refresher. But I think we may as well do a quick little run down. Jules or Dylan, could you let us know what decrim is and how it differs from a legalised or a regulated model? Yeah, so decriminalisation of sex work is the best evidence-based model of sex industry regulation and it is the model that sex workers have been calling on for decades. 
And um, what's great is that in recent years, we've just been getting a growing mountain of research and evidence that supports that decriminalisation is the best model of sex industry regulation from just about every aspect that you can view it in. So Amnesty International has recently um, supported from a human rights perspective and international labour organisation from a work health and safety perspective. The World Health Organisation has made a technical recommendation to say it's the best practice model um, from a public health perspective. And um, the list just goes on and on and on. Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women and Children, you know, I think there's that mistaken belief that, you know, it's only it's only the best model for happy hookers and it doesn't, you know, it's not the best model for, for people who are experiencing workplace violations or m- may have experienced violence at work. Well, the evidence has shown that it's actually the exact opposite. When sex work's criminalised or licensed, it actually creates barriers for people being able to assert their workplace rights and from being able to go to the police in the event of the crime. But by um, contrast, evidence has shown, you know, in places where sex work has been decriminalised, that access to police is increased because you're not fearing being arrested because just because you're a sex worker. And uh, also that, uh, you know, you're able to use those mechanisms of protection that every other worker is able to access. Um, Dylan, did you want to talk about how the contrasts with licensing in Victoria? Yeah, so the current model in Victoria, or not not current for too much longer, thankfully, yay. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the current model in Victoria is licensing. People sometimes call it legalisation, but the, the most accurate term is licensing, and that's the model that's in place in Queensland as well. And what licensing does is it creates a two-tiered sex industry. So it tries to drop basically a bunch of kind of one-size-fits-all laws down on top of sex work and the sex industry to manipulate it um, into those parameters. But that doesn't work. So what it does is it produces, I guess, a small part of the sex industry where some sex workers and some sex work businesses are able to comply or attempt to comply with these really, really ridiculously complex, discriminatory and and dangerous laws. And sex workers who can't comply with those laws, we're forced to work outside of the legal framework where we're at, you know, heightened risk of police targeting, of arrest, face major barriers to accessing services. And I think the really important thing for people to understand about licensing is that it's not the case that if you are able to comply with the laws that everything's okay. Even if, you know, even for those of us who are able to work within the current framework, we're still being regulated by the police and we're still being forced to make decisions based on navigating the laws rather than based on our health and safety needs. You know, and and there's a a number of really problematic features of, of the current licensing model. So, you know, independent sex workers being required to register um, and those records being held, um, you know, forever. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say that's like I consider myself as somebody who is able to abide by many of the the laws that are currently in place in Victoria, one of those being that my name is on that register. Mm. But what happens, you know, in five years if I'm in a different situation and I need Mm. that name not to be on there? So it's also even people who can abide by all of them may not, you know, the long-term effects may not um, be apparent. Or even even if you were a sex worker for your whole life, right, we still shouldn't have to have that kind of surveillance over us, right? Right? Absolutely. Because of the kinds of, I think, you know, there have been so many negative effects of those registration requirements for workers. Um, you know, there are examples of that impacting people in, you know, in, in child custody hearings and immigration situations and, you know, in, in situations that people wouldn't expect to have any connection to this. So it's really problematic. I think also we can talk about mandatory testing and criminalisation of sex workers living with HIV or with other STIs or bloodborne viruses. That's a huge problem in Victoria. And it's not based in evidence at all. Um, it's only something that exists really to stigmatise us. It's based in these ideas of, um, you know, hookers as vectors of disease, right? That's the, that's the ideology here. And it produces that even more. So I think we could also talk about advertising regulations. That's a huge problem in Victoria under licensing. And we could also, you know, I think talk about, of course, the criminalisation of street-based sex work, which is a huge problem as well. So, um, yeah. Licensing um, is huge, yeah, huge failure. Licensing is bad. Is my summary there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with that. But yeah, absolutely. And I think, quite simply put, it's just like you know the 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 parts of work that we do that for everybody else 
would have like no police engagement mm. whatsoever is actually regulated by the police. So even if you've, you know, like contravened advertising regulation by saying something or, you know, at defining your ad- advertising in a, in a way that you shouldn't have, like as other people might do in other industries, well, they don't get the cops actually calling them up and cops actually regulating. Yeah. All those different areas like that are just, you know, should be regulated by those existing bodies that are in place and also, you know, just kind of, all, all the, the usual things that other people are not criminalised or regulated by police, it, it's like a daily experience for Victoria, Victorian sex workers. Under the and, a da- and a daily fear, mm. I think, as well. You mm. know, it, it's that constant process of having to make decisions based on those considerations. And, I mean, with advertising as well, in what other industry can you not describe the services you offer when you're advertising them? Or hire I mean, staff. Not, yeah. Or yeah. hire staff. Or, you know, yeah, exactly. It's it's really ridiculous. On to this week's wonderful news. What are the positives that Victorian sex workers can expect to come about as a result of the passing of this bill? Yeah, look, this is a, I think it's a huge achievement for our community and a fantastic recognition from, you know, from the Victorian government of sex work as work. And, you know, I think, um, you know, for any sex workers listening to this, I think we're all really aware of how long and how hard Victorian sex workers and sex workers across Australia have fought for this and organised for this and campaigned for this. I, I don't even know how many, like hundreds, hundreds or more of sex workers, right? So it's, you know, it's really an historic achievement. And I think the bill delivers a huge number of positive outcomes for our community. So I think we could talk about, um, there's a, there's a lot of really strong things in the bill. I think some of the, some of the things that are really exciting are the, you know, the, the repeal of the Sex Work Act. The, the Sex Work Act of 1994 uh, has been violating sex workers' rights in Victoria since it's existed. And I think as part of that, some of the things that I, I think are really exciting are an end to mandatory testing requirements and the criminalisation of HIV and STI for sex workers. I think also the end of registration is, is hugely positive. Um, and as part of that, you know, we've had a, we've had a really um, important commitment from, from the government, um, you know, during the, uh, during the debate to destroy the, the register records, which is something that, you know, the whole community was of course very concerned about. Um, we, we knew that the registration requirement was going, that's a fantastic part of the bill, but there were real concerns about the records being held as a historical record, which was really unnecessary. You know, yeah. those records should never have existed in yeah. the first place. So I think a really important part of addressing that injustice is the destruction of those records. I've heard a lot of creative suggestions from other sex workers about <laughs> how we could verify that, how we could celebrate it, how we could perhaps participate in the destruction ourselves. Yeah. Um, so I'm sure perhaps we need to run a kind of uh, need to run a community survey and pick the most creative option or something and have a big party um look so that's really positive um I'm really excited about the fact that we will have more options in terms of how we work we're not going to have this dichotomy anymore of so-called illegal brothels or you know illegal independent work illegal escorts etc and and licensed brothels that's been a huge problem in Victoria for such a long time I'm so excited to be able to without fear of policing or without fear of discrimination from landlords to be able to see clients from my own space that's huge and to work you know and to have co-workers to do that um i think that's really important for so many of us right jules do you want to do you want to add on yeah look i mean there are so many great things about the bill what's a bit disappointing is you know it has been something that's been a very strong part of our organising in, you know, around sex work decriminalisation has been the call for decriminalisation for everyone. And part of that has been, it's, it's, it's bittersweet because we are really excited about the positive developments, but mm. particularly the parts that are, are still unresolved. So it feels like it's unfinished business. And in particular around street-based sex work, I mean, that's huge. And unfortunately, you know, the government does see it as a way of decriminalising street-based sex work because 
it's partially happened. But as we know, there's no such thing as partial decriminalisation. That is essentially still criminalisation, right? Mm. You know, yeah, like... It's partial criminalisation. <laughs> yeah. It's partial, well, it's partial. I, I mean, it's just a criminalisation model entirely, right? Because, you know, if, uh, I guess for, for those listening at home, if you haven't seen this part of the bill, what it does is it criminalises street-based sex work and therefore street-based sex workers and also the clients of street-based sex workers, um, you know... Uh, at certain times of day, near certain places, um, and on particular days of the year for 24-hour periods. Um, those, those days are yet to, yet to be defined by the government. But what that means is that the police are the regulators still for that part of, of, of our community, and that's not okay. I think maybe there might be, I've seen in some other media a kind of perception of this as sort of um, zoning provisions or things like that, and that's not what it is. It is just criminalisation. Those are still, you know, those will still be offences that people can be fined for. Uh, there's a potential for jail time as part of that. And it still is just bringing people directly into contact with police. And as sex workers, we know how harmful that is for, for any of us. Mm. Um, so it is really disappointing, I think, particularly because Victorian sex workers have been so clear throughout this entire process and long before it that what we want is full, genuine decriminalisation. We don't want, like, we can't believe it's not real decriminalisation or <laughs> I think um, I heard Georgie Wolf calling it decrim-ish at one point. Like, that's not what we want, right? We want decrim for everybody with no sex workers left behind. Mm. Um, and so I think it is, It is. I, I do see this as a missed opportunity. It really is. And, and this is what, um, you know, having been part of a, quite a few decrim campaigns across the different jurisdictions in Australia, like it's always, you know, the, the most marginalised within our community that get, you know, and it's street-based sex workers, migrant sex workers that are often thrown under the bus, sex workers living with HIV, you know. And what we're talking about, just to put everything in context, street-based sex work is such a small proportion of our community, you know. It's a small proportion of the community and it is, like, there is no evidence to suggest that decriminalisation is going to result in the kind of outcomes that they're, they're basically you know, regulating at this stage on fear and not any evidence. The evidence in, you know, where street-based sex work has been decriminalised has been it doesn't increase, doesn't mean that there's sex workers standing on every street corners. Street-based sex workers don't set up business outside schools and churches. You no, know, why would they? That's a terrible business model. Totally, right? <laughs> like it just makes no sense. It makes yeah. no sense yeah. whatsoever. So a lot of this is just, again, based on fear. And that's why it's so disappointing because decriminalisation is evidence-informed. It's based on, you know, best practice for for all parties, not just for sex workers but also for the community. Mm -hmm. And then it's retaining these parts that are actually just fear-based. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's that's what's so incredibly disappointing given you know, the the recognition of sex workers' work and yeah. we want that to happen for everyone. You know, other areas that we're um, disappointed and we're, you know, and, and let's just say the fight's not over. We're still, no. you know. <laughs> when we say we're disappointed, we don't mean we've just gone home to feel bad about it. Um, <laughs> I think in Victoria, I think we've, we're taking the weekend to just pause Um but, you know, take a few days and then, then we'll be back to it because, yeah. I love that you say that while currently doing advocacy. But, yeah, <laughs> yes. sure. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Jules, please continue. It's all good. It's, you know, but, but it's you guys. So, you know. Yeah, like, it's fun. This is talking, great. Talking to other whores is not advocacy, you know. True. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. It's, just a, it's just a day ending in a why. <laughs> so, yeah, so there was a few other amendments yeah. that we were sort of hoping would, would pass along with the bill and they didn't. Yeah, look, I mean, and Another big one is the advertising, and look, it's this is this is something that is definitely um, work to be done because in the current bill, how um, it's defined is that the advertising restrictions will stay in place during tranche one, so the first stage, and in tranche two, when the Sex Work Act is completely repealed, then those advertising restrictions themselves become repealed. However, there's a provision in the bill that states that they can create new regulations, right? So what it means is even with the implementation of, of the of now decriminalisation of Sex Work Act, 
as soon as that's implemented, the advertising restrictions are going to remain the same until we get to Tratch 2. And that was incredibly disappointing, especially because mm-hmm. the government recognised that the advertising restrictions don't work. And they recognise that in the statements that, that mm. you know, that these need to be changed. What's the justification then? Why? How do they justify not not proceeding with Oh, that? it's happening. Like the justification is it, it is going to happen. And we're not actually Eventually, seeking, you right. know, and part of the advocacy as well that Dylan and I and many others, you know, Vixen and Scarlet Lights and uh, have been involved in uh, of getting uh, like, you know, getting that, provision which states that they can make new regulations out of the bill has been well we don't you know it's not they might never happen we might not make them then why have that in the bill why give yeah. themselves yeah. that power you know and you know the the victorian the current victorian advertising regulations they've been reviewed they've been gone over so many times you know they they were changed and you know reasonably minor and you know ultimately insufficient ways in oh, 2016 mm-hmm. i want to say mm-hmm. yeah. and you know the <laughs> Both Vixen and Scarlett, we, you know, we spoke at length in our submissions throughout the review, throughout subsequent consultation by the government after the review about all of the problems with the current approach to advertising. Um, in terms of, you know, for se- I mean, we all know this, all four of us here, right? But, you know, for sex workers, advertising, it's not, it's not just a business tool. It's that too, and that's important. But it's also part of our health and safety strategies. It's part of how we negotiate how we, you know, it's a really important thing for us. And yeah, yeah, look, I think it's going to be really important that sex workers advocate on this really, really strongly um, from from now because we don't want to see new regulations introduced. Mm. We don't want to see an end to the current regulations at the end of 2023 and then end up with something else that's, you know, at at some later point. Um, Yeah, it really seems like one of those silly legal things that, it just doesn't really make sense and has you know it's kind of a administrative thing where they've gone yeah we're getting rid of it and then maybe we'll just bring it back in again like oh, and Luther, oh, ridiculous. Yeah. have you seen that yeah. Yeah. like actually i mean when you go into the detail of it it's like they are so specific they are so yep. ridiculously and arbitrarily specific like you know yeah. actually in the in the details going into you know th- th- bits where sheer underwear can be worn but it can't be completely transparent very short shorts hot pants thongs <laughs> and g-strings can be worn but it must cover the genitalia and the anus of a person and this includes <laughs> the use of head hair shadows censorship bars or blurred oh and special God. effects like it's really that specific it's a bit oh. creepy actually it's- I always think yeah. when I read those, it it's quite creepy yeah. that someone spent that long kind of thinking about that, to be honest. Yeah. Um, someone has spent a lot of time on our Scott websites. <laughs> yeah, someone's been deep in, deep in the, yeah, in the Locanto ads history, yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not great. Um, Jesus. Yeah, and, you know, and this is a long history of this in Victoria, right? Like, with online advertising, it used to be the case that, you know, if you didn't want to show your face, you were kind of like, I remember advertising for ages with, like, sort of this, like, yep. sorry, this is, a, of course, an audio format. I'm trying to show <laughs> that you that you couldn't show your body. And so if you didn't want to be face out, you could kind of show, like, your mouth if your mouth wasn't too identifying, which it is for some workers, right, who yes. aren't face yep. out. And then sort of to, yeah, to somewhere in your chest, so yeah, it the was law a, was it could only be a head and shoulders correct. Yeah. photo, yeah, wasn't it? Correct. Which, yeah, yeah. So it's kind of the know. opposite of a lot of what sex workers put out. Yeah, there. and I, I couldn't yeah. describe my race. You know, like that was like part oh of the advertising goodness. restrictions. So I couldn't say that I'm an Asian sex worker. Like that was it. it just had really weird, arbitrary restrictions on in all different ways yeah. and so that's that's another area that re- is requiring continued advocacy particularly because there is a time frame on this where it's yeah. kind of intended to be repealed but there yeah. is also kind of like a window uh, for for that for the creation of new regulations as well and this is again another area of irrational fear you know, there yeah. are advertising standards. And I remember even in the NT campaign, one of the politicians said to me, well, what's going to stop people from having, like, advertising anal sex on billboards on the highway? And it's like, <laughs> well, because, it, you know, there's advertising restrictions. It doesn't mean that sex work's decriminalised and suddenly sex workers can do whatever we want. 
yeah. great, but it doesn't work that way. It just means that we become subject to existing regulations. But yeah. however, people aren't satisfied with that. They want us to have specific regulations yeah. in place just yeah. for sex workers. And again, that's really going against what decriminalisation is. It's intended to treat sex work like any other work. But these, this specific regulation means that it's, again, treating us differently. Yeah, and I think I'd also just to add on to what you mentioned before, Jules, another area where advertising is really a big problem is for trans sex workers as well mm. in terms of being able to, um, you know, describe our bodies and things about ourselves, which is a pretty important safety issue as well as just an important thing about marketing potentially, you know, because, Definitely. again, we are all doing this to make money. Yeah, because yeah. sex workers work. But, I, yeah. you know, I think it's it's huge in terms of consent and in terms of, you know, adult conversation before sexual experiences. I mean, that's what we should be encouraging for everyone, right? But yeah. then all of a sudden, if there's payment involved, oh, you can't talk about it. You just have to do it and, and hope everyone's going to turn out okay, which we know that they won't. Because if you don't communicate, things yeah. don't go well. We know that. Yeah, and, and as Jill said, there's really no basis for it. There's no evidence base um, I think it is a fear thing. It's a moral panic thing. And also, you know, look, this is always the challenge when you have something like licensing in place. There are hundreds of pages of laws specifically regulating the sex industry in Victoria currently. And I think that it's a big shift for people. You know, decriminalisation isn't about having holding on to that approach. Um, so... Yeah, there's still a lot of important work to do. I think in terms of other, you know, other areas of the bill that did, that well, do still need strengthening. Um, you know, Vixen, Vixen and Scarlet Alliance, we worked really closely with Andy Medic and his team um, to, to get those amendments together, which was fantastic. Really, um, really great, great process. Um, of course, we disappointing, very disappointing that the outcome in the House was was what it was, but um, really grateful to have that support and solidarity and, and that, you know, representation of sex worker rights from, from Andy and his team. But I think, yeah, so some of the areas as well would talk about um, anti-discrimination. So there are some really strong things in the bill around that, you know, the repeal of the current, you know, discriminatory exemption that allows um, accommodation providers, including private landlords, to discriminate against sex workers. Really, really great that that's going. But we do need sex work and sex worker as protected attributes, um, profession, trade and occupation, which is being introduced as part of the bill. You know, that's that's great, but it's it's we know it's not it's not enough. It's not the level of robust anti-discrimination protection that sex workers need. And we have examples, right, of it of it not being enough in other jurisdictions. Yeah. Well, look, you know, with this um, this protection trade, well, this profession trade and calling in um, in uh, ACT. So it's slightly slightly different, but um, essentially the same. Um, and we uh, and you know in previously Victoria and currently still in Queensland and um, and Tasmania there was lawful sexual activity which obviously was grossly inadequate and has continued to be grossly inadequate. Recently, uh, Scarlet Alliance has um, completed a survey together with the Centre for Social Research and Health, and like ninety seven percent of sex workers were still reported daily experiences of di discrimination and, you know we, we, we experience that in every facet of our lives and of course we know that there's many people that engage in sex work that don't identify as sex workers and we also know that there's people that that are, are past sex workers that continue to experience discrimination and we also know that families and associates of sex workers also experience that discrimination for all those reasons we wanted to ensure that there was no leeway to kind of say that no well this doesn't actually fit into those attributes by actually explicitly naming sex work and sex worker it just makes it really clear uh, that these attributes are intended to cover everyone that experiences uh, discrimination yeah. But unfortunately, that was, again, um, something that wasn't picked up. But however, there are um, anti-discrimination processes in place, um, in play kind of around the country. And this is something that all sex worker, Scarlet Alliance and our member orgs are mm. continuing to advocate for in those reforms. And there's still that bill um, in front of uh, New South Wales in New South Wales government, and uh, strangely, as um, I'm not sure if I told you, but um, 
if uh, I think I think Jenna might have heard this before, but strangely, the the per- one person that's actually supported these amendments is Fred Nile. Oh, you, yeah, you, you did say that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's quite, it's quite, it's, yeah that, that was a really interesting piece of information I wasn't I expecting. Know, right? Like, and, again, like, interestingly, when those reforms happened in New South Wales earlier, he was the one that opposed specific restrictions for private se- home-based sex workers in New mm. South Wales as well. I mean, don't get me wrong, his policies are out of this world crazy and really awful. Of awful, awful, awful. But, you know... Just on on a basic level, having somebody as as regressive <laughs> as Fred <Nile> is, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, to to actually recognise, oh yes, well this is a community that experiences so much discrimination that do need these uh, you know specific discrimin- anti discrimination protections, and that's not like let's face it, it's not experienced in other occupations. Other occupations no. don't have the same levels, so it's not the same as saying, oh, look, all workers are protected for this and now sex workers are too because mm. we know it, yeah. it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to take time for us and we need to have um, accessible avenues of redress in order yeah. to be able to challenge this. And, I mean, if he can support that, I think that really sends a pretty clear message to people whose politics you would expect to um be more aligned, yeah. To be more aligned, yeah. there's really no excuse. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I think as well there just needs to be this recognition that the stigma and discrimination we face as sex workers is across all facets of our lives, you know, that it is actually constant. I just think that there, you know, there just isn't an understanding of that from a lot of non-sex workers, um, which is, yeah, which is really a big problem. And I think also that this is about equity. Like, you know, it's it's not sort of special treatment for sex workers, although no. personally I do think that sex workers should get special <laughs> treatment at all times because we're the, the best and most important people in the world. But, but, Agree. but you know, it's, it's about equity, right? It's, it's about things that are necessary to ensure that we're not experiencing discrimination and stigma and to ensure the successful implementation of, of decriminalisation. It's, it's really essential. Speaking about equity and discrimination, that was another... <laughs> Another big provision that, you know, was really disappointing was defeated in the amendments um, was for sex work excuse drugs. So it, in the in the bill, it has, like, actually specifically articulates drugs um, as, uh, a, you know, it already says payment and reward. However, it also specifically articulates drugs. And, of course, you know, drugs are already captured in that concept of reward. It goes even further in some of those provisions where it states that if somebody is exchanging drugs of dependence, and to be clear, the list of drugs of dependence includes every drug you can ever imagine. So it's not just... You know, like what, and some things it, that are not drugs as well, yeah, like, yeah, or some like things that are not in their consumable form as drugs, right. yeah, yeah, okay. But if you if you exchange or or, or offer to exchange these drugs of dependence um, for for in order for someone to engage in sex work or to continue to engage in sex work, then that is considered an indicator of force. So that in itself is an indicator of force, mm-hmm. like, and of course. You know, there's no argument. If somebody is being forced to do sex work, that is a crime. You know, nobody's arguing about that, you know. But what they're saying is an indicator of that that force is happening is the fact, the very fact that somebody's just exchanged sex sex work for drugs. Or just even offered to. Or offered to, yeah. Mm. It means if I were to come up to one of you and offer drugs, then I am forcing you to do sex work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mm. Which I think is, yeah, look, it's, it's obviously really, really problematic. Um, And it extends into another provision as well, right, Jules, also around forcing someone to provide financial support out of sex work, Mm, mm. um, where, where again, that's seen as an indicator in the way this has been expanded now in the bill. So it's really a problem. It's a problem for sex workers who use drugs. I think it's a problem for the partners of sex workers who use drugs as well, Mm -hmm. potentially. Um, It's, and there's no, again, to me, this really does just, there's, yeah, there's no, there's no evidence to support this, it does seem something that's quite policing focused, um, clearly driven by fear, clearly driven by a particular kind of really offensive um, and stigmatizing ideas about about people who use drugs mm. in general. 
um, and sex workers who use drugs specifically. Well, it's like when you were saying before about a lot of these laws are based uh, in, in fear mongering and in um, not in evidence. It's a historical thing that there's so much fear around drug use and around sex work. And so when people combine those two things without evidence, we're not going to get anywhere. There is so much evidence now to support the decriminalization of sex work and the decriminalization of drugs and the support of um, of drug users and um, and people who you know, who are having issues with their drug use or, or anyone, you know, who, who is vulnerable. But but criminalising has never – there is no evidence to support that as a, as a way of helping any community or, or health network or yeah, – Absolutely. Or an individual. And, yeah. I mean, in general, that's the thing, right? Like, I think as sex workers, what we've really been asking for through this process is this crazy idea that perhaps what happens could just be based on actual evidence, like, <laughs> rather than – rather than on, wild. I know, it's a wild <laughs> idea, Imagine right? It. Totally wild. <laughs> Totally wild. But like, I think, um, you know, I, I do think that's kind of a, you know, as we've all been discussing, a pretty consistent theme through a number of the of those problems in the bill that mean that this mm. doesn't go all the way to full decriminalisation is they are those bits of, you know, I think vestiges of a licensing approach of that mindset still kind of seeping through and also just kind of moral panic and fear. So disappointing. And just so much of it is just nonsensical. Like, so if, you know, if I have sex yeah. with my dealer and he pays me for that exchange mm. and then I go, okay, cool, here's the money for the drugs I'd like, that's fine? Yeah, but just as long as he didn't give you the drugs, you know. <laughs> it's yeah. correct. It has to be oh. a little step in between. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind it's of, it's, it's... Do you know how many guys I've slept with for drugs in my past? Like, oh, I yeah. Mean, I don't... <laughs> that, that, you know, I, I'm sure, like, it's like, it's not something that's unusual um, in... No. Not just yeah. in a sex work context. Yeah. You know. It's but, civilian wise. Yeah. No, I know plenty of people who wouldn't describe themselves as a sex worker, but they've mm-hmm. certainly, that's certainly something that's happened at, you know, one point. Oh. Yeah. maybe many points in their life um yeah. it's not uncommon and that's, and that's a criminal act for sex workers yeah wild. yeah but it is it is explicitly something that is yeah. you know um in in this decriminalization of sex work bill yeah yeah wow mm. fascinating okay before Gosh. i bog you down uh, wait are there any other points they're the, they're the main ones that, that yeah. We, yeah they're the main ones that we've been pushing for I feel like you're just pushing shit uphill. Like I feel like all of my civilian friends have been in touch and they've gone, look what's happened, Holly, there's decrim. Yeah. And I'm like, you don't even realise that this isn't even the beginning or the end. <laughs> like there's so much yeah. that, and it just, every time you think you take a few steps forward, there's more shit to fight against. It's just incredible. Yeah. So true, Holly. And, you know, it's been, um, it's hard because, you know, there's we've all been receiving those messages like congratulations mm. and it just feels... You know, I mean, there's a lot of positives, but it also feels really wrong to be celebrating in the face of, you know, what's still left to do. Yeah. So, yeah. And the people who have been left behind. Exactly. Yeah, because this isn't because this isn't going to mean decrim for all of us. And, uh, you know, I think it's I think it's 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 been so powerful to see Victorian sex workers across all part, you know, across all kinds of different sex work and all kinds of sex work experiences be so clear about that, that there's, you know, there's, there's no in between option that we actually won't accept anything less than full decriminalization. That is for all of us. It's really important that people do feel proud of what we have achieved. You know, we don't get many wins, I think. And so it's really important that everyone, you know, this what we have got hasn't happened by accident, right? It's sex workers have done this. Like, you yeah. know, the government's Huge. important, um, MPs are important, but but sex workers have made this happen. But yeah, then at the same time to look at it and to you know to see some of the you know some of the media co- uh, coverage that you know uh, I remember when the bill you know, when the kind of preview of the bill was was released or announced um, in August last year, I remember seeing articles describing it as like world, a world first in legislation, you know, that Victoria was was doing a world first. And look, this is not a world first. This is not best in the world. Uh, there's, there's a long way to go. And yeah, I know that I've been feeling very, I think, yeah, I mean, bittersweet is the word, but also just, yeah, it gets quite heartbreaking actually to have gotten this far for it to come so close and to just, you know, to, to have these critical problems still remain. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think heartbreaking is is spot on and a really valid response to it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and also, I mean, I guess the implication too, because as we know, there's been a lot of momentum in the other states and territories too, mm-hmm. right? 
So that, you know, we had that really positive example from the Northern Territory that doesn't criminalise uh, street-based sex work, you know, and that did uh, what's, did set a great precedent and that just happened, you know, now like two years ago. Unfortunately, we don't want to see uh, this happening. And, of course, because of the provisions in place for street-based sex work in New South Wales, a lot of the Victorian politicians were saying, well, you know, New South Wales do this and we've gone further than New South Wales. So, you know, Mm. it just sets that already sets up what is already a difficult battle and makes that more difficult for um, that uh, debate kind of moving forward. So I think, um, but as we said, still, it's still, uh, we're still going um, and it's still, we're still going to fight and this is something that, yeah, we'll continue, continue advocating for. Do you miss the free and affordable ads and social networks without all of the anti-sex rhetoric? Assembly 4 is a team of sex workers and technologists from Melbourne, Australia, aiming to bring back free and fair advertising and social spaces to the sex working community. Stepping away from the clunky design of traditional platforms, their two products, Trist.link and Switter.at, are refreshing and well-needed changes in both presentation and mission. And both are free to join and open to all. You can find both of our profiles on Trist, and I love how it is so clearly designed by sex workers. Yep, and I love how straightforward and easy it is to use and how much they clearly support the sex working community. And also how responsive they are when it comes to feedback and customer service. Check out their website, assembly4.com, for the word, not the number, for more info. Um, Okay, so moving on to some more positives and the logistics of things. So as a part of the process of implementing this bill, Scarlet Scarlet Alliance has received funding to Auspice Vixen. So this is another massive step given that Vixen has been running completely unfunded, literally on the blood, sweat and tears of volunteers for at least 20 or nearly 20 years, I think. Uh, Yeah, close to that since 2005. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, so what, what does this funding mean for Vixen? What can we expect? Oh, you look, you can expect a lot. It's very exciting. Um, yeah, so no, so it's really exciting that Vixen is becoming, becoming a funded organization and it's really, really exciting, um, that we are, you know, doing that in partnership with our, you know, our, our wonderful national peak body, um, Scarlet Alliance, (laughs) because, you know, um, I think as, as we, you know, as we've seen in other places, there's quite a lot of support that's needed to get to that point of autonomy and independence. Um, and what we really want to see in Victoria is an ongoing, sustainable, powerful, you know, genuinely representative, 100 percent, you know, sex worker peer run organisation um, for many, 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 many years to come in Victoria. So. Um, at the moment, um, we, you know, we are still in kind of very much in the initial transition phase. So there's, there's a lot happening behind the scenes with a, in a pretty frenzied way, I think it would be fair to say. Um, because, you know, at the moment, this is a six month funding contract. We, we do, of course, very much hope that that will be extended. Um, but that's why this news has kind of crept up on everybody so quickly. Um, it's all happened really, very fast. Um, and, yeah, Jules, do you want to speak a little bit about the, um, I guess maybe also the Scarlet Alliance experience with, with sure. auspicing as well? Sure. Look, and it's um, something to understand is that this is a massive gap in the Victorian sex worker landscape, that they, there hasn't been a funded peer organisation. And, you know, that's something that we're really proud of in Australia, the fact that we have this 100% peer movement, you know, and um, unfortunately that hasn't always been the case. Like in uh, for a number of our organisations, they've been auspiced through other entities as well, so haven't been able to operate independently as sex worker-led organisations. And so, you know, Scarlet Alliance have um, assisted, um, it has, it's a key part of our strategic plan to uh, basically support state state and territory sex worker organisations to independence. Um, But again, that's not something, that's not a call that Scarlet makes. That's, you know, we hear that call from uh, local sex workers and uh, willing to support and have some experience and expertise in having done this in other states and territories, Uh, most recently with SIN, your amazing 100% peer-led organisation in South Australia, and really excited to be on this journey with um, Vixen. Um, And this is really um, the start 
start of a really exciting journey. Um, and absolutely, it's just it's so great, and it's really amazing to sort of feel the enthusiasm from the community because you can see how many people have just, you know, this is something that not just. Scarlet Alliance and Vixen have been advocating for. This is something that Victorian sex workers have been hungry for for so long yeah. and it's just great that this has kind of created this opportunity to move forward and to have a, a truly representative funded organisation because yeah. that's, yeah, that's a I'm- big difference. It's a huge difference. And I think, you know, to come back to your initial question, Jenna, I think some of the things that I think that people can expect to see really quite soon is really increased access to to things that we need, right, as sex workers. So there hasn't been funded peer outreach, really, in Victoria, and certainly not delivered by a by a 100% peer-run sex worker organisation. Um, that's been a huge gap, and I think that means those gaps are worse for particular parts of our community as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm so thrilled that um, in terms of, you know, the roles that, that we were able to advertise, that we're going to have this really powerful, quite massive um, peer educator team with, you know, with specific projects as well. So would you be able just to give for our listeners who don't understand what peer outreach is, what that means that you guys will be able to provide to the community? Yeah, great question. So when we talk about peer outreach, it uses a model that's not like, you know, social work as we understand it. It's probably closer to the back backroom peer education that happens in brothels, you know. So it's that skill share. And, of course, when you have somebody coming into your workplace – and they're not a peer. They're not. A, they're not themselves a sex worker. There's already a, a differential in power dynamics, and there's also a lot of explaining that has to be done by the worker in order for the person that's supposedly providing those services to understand your situation in order to provide you with support. But this is why the peer uh, model has been successful. Is It's about skill share so that a peer educator can come and offer information, connection to and referrals to other services, but at the same time also hear from the peer worker what's happening on the ground for them um, to feed back into uh, whether we're feeding that back to the government or whether they're feeding that back into the project work. So it's it's not it's there's not that sort of inherent kind of service user and client um, you know power differential in the way that peer education yeah. works. It's actually about peer skill share, education, support, advocacy, referrals networking yeah all that stuff that we um so this is this is going to help sex workers in victoria feel a lot more connected and get a lot more support um at a grassroots level like individually absolutely and uh, and, and great for networking yeah absolutely and i think the other thing that it's going to do is you know not having had a funded peer organization in victoria what that's meant is i think when we've tried to access services that are funded, a lot of us have had the experience of being treated in that language of service users or clients or, you know, people who are coming from a, you know, doing something to us kind of perspective, whether that's rescuing us or referring us to something. And I think what that's actually done is it's devalued the expertise, right? We, sex workers are the experts on sex work and the most important um, qualification for someone to be a peer educator is is their identity as a sex worker and their experience as a sex worker. So I think it's going to be a really empowering experience for our community and not just in terms of that aspect of things, but just to have the resourcing. Vixen, we've been doing our best for a long time, but, you know, we acknowledge that there's there's massive gaps. You can There's really only so much you can do when you have no funding. And so we know that that's had huge, huge impacts that have been really negative for our community. And so it's, I think, the recognition of government that uh, that this is something that's required is going to... Yeah, I'm just, I'm really excited for what this means for, I think, advocacy as well um, and for community participation. I mean, look how much Victorian sex workers have already achieved in two years of COVID restrictions, of not having access to so many of the things that sex workers haven't had access to during COVID, not having access to a funded peer organisation. We've achieved so much around decrim and so much more as a community on less than the smell of an oily rag. Um, And with sex workers just helping each other, which is what we always do, right? Sex workers do it for ourselves, I think, incredibly powerfully. Um, And we'll still be doing it for ourselves, but um, with money, which is also something that as sex workers we like. So (laughs) what's what's not to love, right? Yeah. (laughs) 
So yeah. where to from here? When will the bill actually come into effect and how does the fight for full decrim continue? Sure. So there's two tranches of the bill. Disappointingly, um, the commencement of the bill of that first tranche or stage has been, it was supposed to be uh, the start of March. Yeah, because the bill didn't pass at the end of last year uh, due to a variety of, of reasons, including the whole pandemic legislation mess. Disappointingly, again, we are going to have to wait a little bit longer. Um, and obviously, you know, one more day under the current laws is too many days. Um, but, you know, so the first tranche comes into effect on the 10th of May, which is also the deadline the government set in the upper house on Thursday for the destruction of the register records, uh, which we will be um, obviously keeping keeping a close eye on and ensuring that that, that that happens. So May 10, and then the second, the second tranche comes into effect on or before uh, it's the 1st of December 2023. So some things will change immediately. Um, unfortunately, um, the full kind of dismantlement of the licensing system, including the, you know, the brothel licensing system, that's going to take longer, you know. So it is still kind of an 18-month or more wait. Is it something that they could continue to push out or are those? do you think those deadlines are quite locked in? Those deadlines are locked in. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so that's, that's um, that was actually um, yeah no fair enough because given that the the initial date was the first of March yes, in the bill yeah it's a fair question yeah yeah but the, the, there was an amendment proposed by the government which did pass uh, which was which was um, opposed by um, some um, uh, but unfortunately like such as anti medic and Samantha Ratnam as well um, but um, from the Greens um, mm. but uh, unfortunately. Um, it uh, did get the support and did pass to actually extend that first date out till the 10th of May. And I think, yeah, look, it, and part of that too is because they have to have that consultation on those special days in which street-based sex workers are going to continue to be criminalised on, you know, those days yeah. of religious significance, you know. So it's, uh, I think that... Do they think that the sex is happening on the footpath? Yeah. Like, is that... <laughs> Well, I think that's what they've, yeah, I don't know if the government thinks that, but I think that by setting things up that way, they've certainly made the public think that. Yeah. I think that um, this kind of fixation on particular places of worship and particular other, you know, other kinds of locations as well, and particularly the thing about, yeah, specific religious holidays, I think it kind of exacerbates whatever whatever stigma-based and stereotype-based misconceptions some people would already have had. I mean, you know, we all know that if somebody's having sex on the street, well, at all, regardless of where it's in front of, there's you know there's there's already there's already yeah. the ability for that person to be um you know to be told to stop that by the police. Like it doesn't whether they're a sex worker or someone else. Yeah. There's not you know it, it isn't and nobody's doing that right. Like sex workers are not having sex on the street in front of a church. <laughs> No, yeah, no, no. no, but we're gonna we're all gonna start turning Not up with job. our you know upside down yeah. crucifixes and tails and start <laughs> yes. like fornicating on the steps of the Catholic yes, Church of yes. <laughs> yeah. because we'd want anything to do with that. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I think that, that was time. some some bad yeah. you know seventies horror movie that I might have watched. You know, yeah. <laughs> but um, even when we were trying to, um, I, I know that when we had our sex worker rally outside the Opera House um, on Horse Day as well. You know, and it was, you know, Horse Day, it's in the middle of winter, like right, you know, smack bang in the middle of winter. And I know in the permit we were being asked about, well, you know, we do. It, there's going to be families around because that's, you know, there's people around families and, and, you know, we don't want people to be around there but exposed to nudity and, <laughs> you know, and it was like, like, like somehow that sex workers don't have families, like we don't have children, oh like somehow we're immune to the cold, so we'll be there standing yeah. there <laughs> naked in the freezing cold. Right. Like there's all these kind of really quite um, strange misconceptions mm. that continue to drive public policy, which is really incredibly disappointing given the, the big strides forward that we've had in recognising sex workers' work. And I think the thing as well, like just thinking of, of that issue, is that it does produce this idea that there's two categories of people, right? There's sex workers and then there's people who have children or people who practice a religion. Yeah. Yes. And we know that, yeah. you know, like radical idea, right? But as sex workers, we're already in people's communities. We actually yeah. do live and work in our communities. Um, our religious, and, you know, as well. And our religious, religious and, you know. Have kids. 
Yeah. yeah. And I think we know, you know, we know as sex workers that currently what happens, um, you know, what has happened in Victoria over many year- years around street-based sex work policing particularly is it's actually not just, it hasn't only been the case that people have experienced policing while they are actually doing doing their job. It's also been the case that people have been regularly harassed by police or by members of the public as well while they're just walking around doing things like, you know. Um, Existing. Yeah, going to the supermarket or um, walking to pick their kids up from school or things like that. And so it's it's really a big problem, especially when we are talking about, you know, pretty small, a pretty small community usually. So it's it's very it's very concerning and is why, yeah, you know, the, the fight really doesn't stop here. This is this is unfinished business and this can't be like this for the next 20 years or something. Right. Um, this is something that needs to change as soon as it possibly can. And as I said before, I think we've all seen really clearly, um, not just here in Victoria, but in so many other examples, right, of what sex workers can achieve when we organise together. Um, so I think everybody should be very prepared for what sex workers will be doing to change to change those problematic elements of the laws and make sure we do actually get full decriminalisation um, that doesn't discriminate against some of us. Yeah, and also, you know, things like this radio show, it's really important in destigmatizing, yeah. you know, sex work and sex workers. And even though we have, de- even when we do get decriminalization, full decriminalization, it doesn't mean stigma and discrimination ends overnight. So it's um, ongoing uh, to ensure that people fully understand who we are, you know. Yeah, that's our, our big thing the whole time with this show has been humanizing it. And, and saying, yeah, we have families and we are just people as, I mean, people. Yeah, preaching yeah. to the converted, but that's the whole thing. It's just about people understanding that we're everywhere and we're, we're just people. I have to say, I did, I, I did really like the tale of two titties, though, so that was a good suggestion, <laughs> especially with the photo. It's such a great photo and I just thought, yeah. yeah. That was Mr Love's doing. Yeah, no. He I'm, came up I'm, with that I'm one. I've got to say, <laughs> it did have a ring to it. It yeah. <laughs> reminds me of those so, bad porns. You know how they always have puns? I love that. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, you know? yeah. yes. Yep. We're so grateful to have you guys, you know, representing the community as a whole and, and working so hard on what you guys have done and knowing that that, uh, it, particularly that you're so busy at the moment that, you know, coming to join us here on the show today and um, and just in general for everything you guys do, um, I know it doesn't stop and I know as a community we see the finished product, you know, for, as, a, as a headline or we see little bits and pieces of media here and there but there is so much more that goes on behind the scenes and, uh, and I struggle to turn up for this podcast every week because I'm that disorganised. I don't know how... Uh, <laughs> Uh, both of you, Dylan and Jules, how you maintain everything that you do, and uh, and we're super grateful. Um, Look, thank, yeah. thanks so much. It's wonderful to be here, and I guess I'd just say that you know we're we're part of our community too. You know, I think sex yeah. workers sustain each other, right? That's the only way that we're able to do this together as sex workers. Um, Solidarity. And um, no, lovely to be here, and yeah, it's um it's it's a big honour to get to do this work. I think it's a lot yeah. of trust from community. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> where where can people keep up to date with what's happening? Give us the social medias and the all of that. Yep. So for Vixen, it's at Vixen Collective. Um, on Twitter and uh, we're on Facebook as well. We're not currently on Instagram, but uh, watch this space. Um, website is uh, just vixencollective.org. Um, and if, all this will be linked down below as well. Yeah, great. Um, Jules? Yeah, absolutely. And Scarlet Alliance, you know, at Scarlet Alliance on Twitter and Instagram and also on Facebook and also at our website is scarletalliance.org.au. And if you're a sex worker, please um uh, become a member and you can get on the scarlet list yeah and if you're a, if you're a victorian sex worker and you want to get involved in community meetings because vixen will be can you know that the organizing work is not over there will continue to be community organizing meetings um please email info at vixencollective.org um and uh or, or look out for you know for our next meeting on on twitter or on our website brilliant thank you so much see you soon thanks, thanks so much thank you. Bye. Thanks a lot. bye bye We'd like to thank our ever-generous patrons. Our new generous somebodies are Athena Palace and Mr Palace. Our new very generous somebody, Jasmine. Our even more generous somebodies, Timmy, Andrew, Adam Smith, Lachlan, Sub London, Miss Billy, Nora Knightley, Leslie, Scott Watson. Andrew, our secret admirer, Margaret, Wheezy, Ellen, Liam, Fritzia Tits, Catherine, Mr E, Scott C., Simon, Skippy, 
FN and our footstool. And our extremely generous somebodies are Aaron, Andrew, Pete, Amanda Valentina, Sienna Saint, Brino, Adam Moore, Nick, Wombat, Josh, and Theodore Betts, the first Esquire. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, We know this was maybe probably a few less laughs in this episode than usual, um, but it's a really important one and um, we appreciate you taking the time to, yeah, have a listen. We hope you've learned something and uh, that you continue to support us in our fight for uh, for decrim for all sex workers. Fuck yeah. Please look out for us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook and Patreon. Our name everywhere is Somebody You Pod, as in podcast. Our Patreon starts at just $3 a month and you can get all of our episodes ad-free and a day early, plus bonus episodes, behind-the-scenes action, bloopers and more. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the voices of sex workers. And remember, somebody you love might just be a sex worker. 